that worship said good morning. Good morning. Okay, I just want to make sure you're awake. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts. Um, today we'll be doing the 24th installment uh, in this series. And I think officially we're almost halfway there. So somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wanted to go another year. Um, Acts chapter 14. Today's an incredible day, incredible opportunity for some guys uh, to have completed a, I won't say a stepping stone, a tremendous milestone in life. Uh, if you can go from a place uh, where your life is completely wrecked, God puts everything back together and creates a whole new life for you. Uh, you learn a whole lot about God in the time you're at new birth. And there's a couple of words you'll definitely learn. One is no. <laughs> Learned that one really well. Uh, the gentleman in that fancy vest back there, he will teach you that word and the original meaning. Uh, and every time he tells you no, even though you don't want to hear it, if you will just listen, it will always pay off. So we're going to celebrate some guys today that have made this milestone. That's always incredible. But we've got to continue this journey because Paul and Barnabas had gone to Antioch which I thought Antioch was a pretty cool place because that was where Christians were first called Christians. And they're there preaching and some people are receiving, some people not. And it turns out in Antioch that some of the, some of the Jews in town decided to, uh, I, I don't understand the historical ties of all this, but obviously there were some very wealthy women in town. And they stirred up the wealthy women in town to get these guys out of town. And so there was a lot of persecution, false accusations, things like that thrown at Paul. And Paul basically says, look, let's just pack up. We'll dust, shake the dust off our feet and we'll go to a place called Iconia. So here's where we pick up in chapter 14 of the book of Acts is now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogues. It spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Now, today I want to simply talk to you about one subject. You can see it on the screen. The subject is behind the curtain. Any of you guys ever seen uh, The Wizard of Oz? Yeah. Yeah, y'all seen The Wizard of Oz? Okay. You know, in The Wizard of Oz, everybody was afraid of the great Oz. Um, the great Oz made things happen. He was just, woo. And, you know, at the end of it, they're in there trying to get their heart and their courage. And I don't remember what all they were trying to get. Dorothy just wanted to get home. They had to get some brains for the scarecrow. Uh, the tin man wanted a heart. The, uh, anyway, I'll get lost. The lion wanted courage. Is that all of them or the four? It's all of them. And Dorothy, she wanted to get home. But you remember this? The little Toto, the dog, goes back there and pulls on this curtain and winds up pulling the curtain around. And there's this guy back there making it all happen with smoke and mirrors. And, you know, a sad thing is when I first came into ministry, somebody told me the phrase or brought the phrase up behind the curtain. You know, once you see behind the curtain, it's not what you think it is. But when they saw the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, it wasn't what they thought it was. And... Basically, I plugged that mental state into what they were saying about the church. And I have seen some of that. Because when I say behind the curtain, 
I mean like on a normal Sunday morning in church, you see something that you expect to just not entertain necessarily, but you, you see something that you're expecting God on those people. You're expecting God to be working through those people. So you think those people act like that all the time. Well, not always. See, we're getting back to a place, but that's along towards the end of the message. But I have seen it where people in churches behind the curtain acted completely different than they did on Sunday morning. Completely. And I couldn't understand. That's confusing. Now, let me not get off my message, so just remember that. I just wanted to preface the behind the curtain thing. It's not going to be bad. Churches are good, okay? It's just our perspective of things at times mess us up. The unbelieving Jews stirred up and poisoned their minds against the brothers, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord. Who, now, this is the Lord who bore witness to the word of his, what's that word? Grace. The word of his grace. He bore witness to the word of his grace. Well, how did he do that? Granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Like, to have faith, to pray for the sick and believe that they'll be made well. I got to keep reading. We'll be here all day. <laughs> but the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, <coughs> cities of Lyconia. Is that right? I butchered one. You, forgive me. And the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So there's some interesting things here. The, gospel, the apostles are actually doing what God called them to in Acts 1-8. They're going out, they're preaching the gospel of grace. God is confirming his doing this by giving signs and wonders. People are being healed. Demons are coming out of people. <laughs> People are being delivered and set free to walk in newness of life. And that being said, never was anything to do with the apostles except for them being vessels. So, some people travel all over the country to have certain people lay hands on them because of that signs and wonders stuff. The early apostles knew that if you believed, God would operate through you however he wanted to. Amen. So sometimes if you're sick, you can get up and lay hands on yourself. Amen. Speak the word of God over yourself and believe and let your faith connect with God's grace and watch a miracle happen. Amen. It's as simple as that. You're a child of God. At Lystra, this is verse 8. Oh, I can see it better up here. Now, at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently. Come on, buddy. Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had to be had the faith to be made well. He looked intently at him. I'm looking for some faith. I'm kidding. Uh, no. He's like, he did that again. Um 
They're having a regular Bible meeting. And Paul looks at somebody and makes a connection between that man's faith and God's grace. Next verse. He said in a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. How long has this guy not walked? Ever. Stand up right on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Now, that in and of itself, I don't know how old the guy was, but it says he was a man. Didn't he say he was a man? So that meant in Jewish culture, you were at least going to be 30 years old. So just imagine, 30 years old, you have never walked in your life. And he says, stand and you jump up, spring up, and start walking. That's ever bit as a powerful a minute of a miracle as Lazarus coming out of the tomb. Because this guy's muscles were entropied. He had never walked in his life. And, and this is not Jesus talking to him. This is an apostle allowing Jesus to flow through him. And he says, stand up. Look, I want to know where you are. I know where I want to be in this story, but I want to know where you are. If you hear a word that is directly for you, and you are having faith for that thing, will you be obedient to step out in the faith? If you've never walked in your life... Or the doctors have said, you've got six weeks to live. And somebody says, stand up, you're healed. Will you have the faith to believe God to touch you? Because it's not the person. It's God. And that's why this man was able to spring to his feet. I think he could have danced that day. Because if he could stand and walk, he could dance. Maybe like me, but he could dance. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, I want you to pay, pay attention right there. When the crowds saw what Paul had done, Paul didn't get commentary on this. When the crowd saw what... Y'all finish that for me. They lifted up their voices saying in their own language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. I bet they did. Because you know what their hang up was? They saw what Paul had done. And Paul hadn't done nothing. <laughs> Paul was preaching the gospel. He got a word of knowledge from the Lord, one of the spiritual gifts, speaks to that infirmity, and the guy gets up and starts walking. And they see, pay attention to this, they see what Paul did. <laughs> and they think, well, through my lens of understanding, if this happened, our gods must have come down as men. Next verse. Barnabas, they gave him names automatically. Barnabas, they called Zeus. Hey, in Greek mythology, this big stuff. Called him Zeus. And Paul, they called Hermes. Because he's the chief speaker. <laughs> this is wild. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. And I'm sitting here thinking, if this happened to you, how would you react? Oh, we know the story. We know how Paul acts, but I'm saying, how would you act? Because the crowd only saw Paul speak to this situation, and the guy got up. Their only point of reference to deity were these guys, Zeus, Hermes, 
Now, but if I were Paul, I would be a little more perplexed because some, in some senses, the church, if we're not careful, can lean in that direction. You say, well, that, that doesn't really sound right. I've never seen a pastor get offerings made to him. Really? Uh, I've never seen people give special gifts to pastors that are flowing in the gifts. Have you? But what I've never seen is I've never seen a pastor do any of that. I've never seen a pastor heal anybody. I've never seen a pastor tell somebody to get up and they got up. I've seen God work through pastors come on, come on. by the gifts of the Spirit right. and touch people's life for life change. Yeah. Okay. And then I've seen pastors give glory where glory was due. And see, I think they do that. And I think what we have to watch for is that we can't let pride. Because the, these guys could have gone one or two ways. They, they, the people were saying, this must be Zeus, this must be Hermes. They are, they are preaching articulate words that, are, that bring freedom. And he actually spoke to this guy and he started walking. Let's, let's offer sacrifices to him. Let's, let's bring them a big offering. Let's get this going and let's have a tent meeting for 16 weeks. <laughs> but see, Paul was Paul. He had been with Jesus. And Paul responds in this way. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out. Now, I'm not going to reenact that. Number one, I don't, I don't have the kind of robes to tear, <laughs> nor any desire to tear clothes. But they said, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you and we bring you good news. I hate to keep going over this good news thing, but good news is that. Good news, where we get the phrase gospel, means that you would send out a herald when you found out you won a war. They would go out and stand on the wall of the city and say, we have won the battle. You can go home. Your people are coming home. There's no more fighting to be done. You're no longer needed in the army. It's a done deal. War's over. We win. That's what they're saying in the spirit realm to these people. We've given you, we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God Amen. who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. It's very simple, basic Christianity that we miss all the time. Because I'm going to ask you this. When is the last time something made you doubt the good news? And if something had the power to make you doubt the good news, you unknowingly worship that. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, it could be the simple fact of, man, I just, I just don't, I just don't like John Brown. <laughs> man, that joker. I mean, I know he's sleeping and everything. He'll wake up in a minute. So he's picking on me all the time. Every time I go get some food, they just give me a light plate and... Man, the rules. You seen the rules? My boss is treating me bad. I don't think he likes me either. 
So he's been paying me for 10 years. I'm saying he don't like me. <laughs> Anytime we see a situation that looks bigger than God can fix, and we'll never say that, we just act like it. No. Uh, I know God can fix it, but. I mean, we've, we've just said that, like, we've, we've actually stepped into the realm of practical atheists. Like, we've, we've said, you know, God can fix it with some help from me. Because, you know, since, since he died for me, then he needs me on his team. Well, they need to go on back and start learning the nature and character of God through the scriptures and actually get a little grounded because uh, God was not lonely. That's not the reason he decided to send his son and brutally kill him on a cross so that he'd have somebody to play with in the afternoons in the garden. That wasn't... God gets most glory from a broken people that need a Savior. And when we realize our need for the Savior, that brings God so much more glory. Because without Him, we're nothing. So nobody sees Scott doing anything. If they do, they're looking from a wrong perspective. Does that mean Scott don't do anything? If you're going to say, yeah, just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> um, but if, but Scott cannot lay hands on the sick. Scott cannot speak to somebody that's crippled and tell them to stand up. But if God tells Scott to say something, Scott's going to say it. Amen. Because I know I am a failure in and of myself. Historically, some of you know me for a long time. Historically, I proved it. That's why I like going to church with my family. <laughs> they know. <laughs> but with God, Amen. man, he can take something that was bad, whether it was my stupidity or just a world cir circumstance, and he can flip it around somehow to his good for his glory. And tell me that's not a good plan. In the past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and with gladness. Next one. This is puzzling. Even... With these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. People still wouldn't stop. And I think that those people thought if they pulled back the curtain on Paul and Barnabas, that they were going to see God. They were going to see God's. Not the Wizard of Oz. They thought they were going to see something a lot bigger than what they saw. And Paul told them, if you pull back the curtain, you're just going to see something that looks like you. But there's something that looks like you has something inside. And that something inside is everything. It's the gospel. It's good news. <clears throat> so why is it that we have to think, or we might not ever say it, why is it that we have to act like when you pull the curtain back, you're going to see something that you don't expect? The Wizard of Oz has programmed us to think God's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. The Greeks would have us think that God never did it. 
It was their gods that did it. The weird thing about that is they had a temple to Zeus with a statue of Zeus in front of a temple. And I'm thinking, if he's God, how do you know what he looks like? Because, I mean, even in those old weird movies, he changed the way he looked every time he saw somebody. Which one did you pick? But the only, and we'll get to that in a few chapters, the only altar that was around there that didn't have a statue in front of it was a, was a, a temple to an unknown god. And we'll get to that in chapter 17 because that one was the answer. The thing is, you pull back the curtain, know that you're going to see a very real person. And by pull back the curtain, I mean in ministry. So you're going to have meetings that you see God work in signs and wonders. You will see that. Hopefully, you will see that. You'll see people get set free. You'll see people baptized. You'll see people walk into ministry. And into their lives with the power of God for ministry. But hopefully what you won't see is something other than what you expected. Because God works through people like us. You cut me, I bleed. I cut you, you bleed. And God wants to do the same works through all of us. It's about, can our faith touch his grace? And today, today we ha have a like tangible example of that. Today, I know somebody woke up this morning and they were so excited, just like Christmas morning to them. They, they, they had went, either went out and got something new or they stayed up pressing and yeah. right. cleaned up. This is a major milestone. Someone asked <coughs> Pastor Wayman and